Well, good morning, everybody. We are still here in Hannibal, Missouri. There's a bunch of things that I still have left to see and do in the town of Hannibal, and I need to do them right now. Sure is a beautiful place, huh? And we saw a lot of it in the last video. But those of you who are slightly more eagle-eyed than the others might have noticed something unusual in the background up here on this big hill. That little white thing right there up on the hill, that is, in fact, a lighthouse. Now, at first it doesn't seem that weird because you might be tempted to guess that it's some sort of old-timey helper for the old Mississippi River steamboats, you know? Oh, of course they had lighthouses up and down the Mississippi. But actually, that is incorrect. That lighthouse is actually the Mark Twain Memorial Lighthouse, and it was put there on the occasion of Mark Twain's 100th birthday. No, he didn't live to be 100. He was already dead, but they decided to have a huge birthday party in Hannibal for him anyway. Only instead of a candle on top of a cake, Mark Twain gets a freaking lighthouse on top of a massive hill. Back in Mark Twain's day, this hill was called Holiday's Hill, although in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, he calls it Cardiff Hill. Cardiff Hill, or Cardiff Hill, if you want to get all French about it, was the hill where Tom Sawyer and his buddy were playing swords and playing Robin Hood and stuff. And also the home of the fictional Widow Douglas or the real life Widow Holiday. Some of you guys might remember that the Widow Douglas is the one who adopted and tried to civilize Huckleberry Finn, so this hill would have been the home of Huckleberry Finn in the book. Also, this is the hill that Mark Twain always says, because you can see it pretty much from everywhere in the town. This is the hill he says he remembers looking up at so fondly out of the windows of church or school and just dreaming like, I want to be up there on the on the hill playing. I don't, I don't want to be wherever I am. They probably should have called it Truancy Hill, huh? <laughs> this statue of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn is actually super well known because it was sculpted, I think, way back in 1926, back when there weren't a lot of statues made for fictional characters. But Tom Sawyer was such an epic, legendary book and such a part of the fabric of Americans, like, I don't know, self-image, I guess, that they created this sculpture here and put it at the foot of Cardiff Hill in the book, or Holiday Hill in real life. But the funny part about Tom and Huck here is that in the town, of course, they know that they have this famous statue. It was one of the earliest fictional character statues in the United States or whatever. But over the years, since they're really not paying attention, like on the tour I took yesterday on the trolley tour, they're like, this is famous for being the first statue ever made of little children. <laughs> and I was thinking, no, that's not it. Someone also told me that it's the first statue west of the Mississippi River. That it was the only statue that Mark Twain sculpted himself. And so on and so forth. You get the idea. Every town has those misconceptions or those distortions about its history or those, or, you know, certain famous features in the town or whatever. Like, I can't tell you how many towns I've been to on tour with my band back in the day where people would always tell us, we're the murder capital of the United States. I've been to a lot of murder capitals or we were the head of this or we were the head of that. Like things that were absolutely impossible to be true, but when you looked it up later, you'd find some little kernel. Okay, I'm totally procrastinating about the whole lighthouse thing now, but there's a good reason. This lighthouse isn't just a walk in the park. It's a walk up 244 steps. Ooh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but 244 is a lot of steps. Maybe we'll go back and get a nice ice cream cone? No, okay, fine. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. Wait, why am I counting them like they're seconds? <sighs> this isn't so bad. I can handle this. Yeah. Yeah, we got this, we got this. Uh, it probably doesn't look as high on camera as it does in real life. It's a, it's a lot of steps. Okay, here we go. The first landing up here. Ah, there we go. Flatness, whew. I just found out yesterday that this big main flat area here up underneath the hill is here because the old highway bridge used to cross the Mississippi River right here. It was the original Mark Twain Memorial Bridge, and it was dedicated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's right. That old polio maniac FDR was right here to dedicate the bridge that was built as part of his whole New Deal thing. It was like a federal program and everything. And this is where the highway bridge was right here. You can see where it used to connect on the Illinois side right over there. Crazy. I've been here a couple times. I have never ever, ever noticed that this was like where the sidewalk ends, you know? That's pretty cool. Nowadays, the main highway through Hannibal crosses a little bit north of here over the new school Mark Twain Memorial Bridge, but apparently it used to come right down here, right next to the old downtown. So in a way, Hannibal's been bypassed just like all those Route 66 towns we passed by. All right, looks like this is the biggest part of the climb. I'm ready. Oh, that's a lot of stairs. Ooh. 
Dang, that's a nice house. I don't think that was here last time I was going up these stairs. I think it's just a little farther to the top. Uh, uh, uh. There's a train every five minutes in this town. Oh no. You gotta be kidding me. That wasn't 244 already? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I can do it. It's okay. I can do this. It's okay. It's okay. Is that a bathtub? That's weird. All right. Oh, look. We're at the top. We're at the top. When it's not a train, it's a riverboat. Oh, we hear ya. Oh my God, you guys. That wasn't the top. Not only was that not the top, there's a freaking parking lot up here. We could have just driven up here. Oh boy, okay. So this is the last, final set of steps. It's a good thing I'm so athletic. Whew. I have so much performance. They call me performance fleece. They don't call me that. Uh, nothing challenging about this at all. Oh, that's a long way down. <laughs> I'm not actually tired. Just hamming it up for hamming it, hamming it up for you guys. Okay, I can make the rest of my two feet strong, like a man, uh, or apparently like one of these ladies here. Whatever. It's not about who comes in first place. It's about who finishes, so. Endurance, you know? I wasn't going for for length. I was going for tone or, or something. Oh, wow. The Mark Twain Memorial Lighthouse. But look at that beautiful, beautiful view of the Mississippi. And that breathtaking view of town. And there's Lover's Leap over there where we were yesterday. And the beautiful, Memorial Lighthouse. Uh, uh, oh yeah, this was uh, this was totally worth it. Uh, apparently they just started having a circus downtown right when I get up here. This sign is so cool. It basically says that FDR pushed a button from the White House to light the uh, to light the lighthouse on Mark Twain's 100th birthday, and that's what started it. Also, his daughter Clara talked about it from Detroit, so they all love Mark Twain. Not enough to actually come here, but you know, they it's the thought that counts. So FDR lit that thing, that's pretty cool. Wait a second, what the heck is this? This here says the original lighthouse blew over in a windstorm. Oh, it says it was rebuilt in 1963, and uh, John F. Kennedy lit the lighthouse the next time. And then way later there was like a, a new paint job or something and Bill Clinton lit the lighthouse. So apparently Bill Clinton couldn't think of his own Hannibal idea, but that's fine. We visited the Mark Twain lighthouse. Nailed it. Totally, totally worth it. Still frustrating to find out that there's a parking lot up here though. Right in this old quarry where the townsfolk used to get their stones and young Sammy Clemens Mark Twain used to actually play up here. You know what's weird is, the more that I look at that car, the more that it looks like my car. What in the world? Mark Twain? What's the meaning of this? Do you even have a driver's license? Now you listen to me, Junior. If I can handle a Mississippi River boat, I think I can handle one Nissan Versa. Oh, that is so true. If I remember correctly, somewhere back up on this hill, there's a pretty interesting Hannibal location. Ooh, we found it. This is one of Hannibal's oldest cemeteries and it dates from way, way back to the early, early days of the town, the Tom Sawyer days. As a matter of fact, this is the place where Mark Twain's dad was buried. So young Sam Clemens would have had to come to this cemetery and be very sad as they laid his father to rest here. They've since moved his dad and the rest of his family are all in a different cemetery on the other side of town, a nicer cemetery. And that's because even by the 1880s, they really weren't using this cemetery anymore. Yeah, a burial here, a burial there. But for the most part, this was kind of the derelict, out of use, more or less abandoned cemetery. By the time the 1930s rolled around and the 100th anniversary of Mark Twain and they were dedicating the bridge and doing all that stuff, by that time, this place had so few burials and it really wasn't being taken care of that it started to look 
all crazy and janky like this. And because in the book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, the cemetery where the whole murder scene is at, if you haven't read it, I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but read the book. That whole cemetery where that happens is described as being this crazy old cemetery and all that stuff. So the town started promoting this as Tom Sawyer Cemetery, the cemetery from Tom Sawyer. But even with that illustrious distinction, this cemetery became completely abandoned and had its last burial in the 1950s. Look at this here, right here. You see, Laylee Marshall here. She died in 1918. She was just a kid, just 13 years old. And you can see this headstone is made out of concrete and the name is just written into the wet concrete there. So this was not a place that you buried people that had money. By 1913 even, this is a place where people with, with, with no money, a pauper's graveyard basically. So anyway, after the 1950s when nobody used this place anymore, it became essentially forgotten and apparently... It all became completely and totally overgrown. The trees and jungle, like all this stuff here, was covering the entire cemetery. Kids were growing up in the neighborhood here next to a cemetery they didn't even know was there. Of course, eventually some people figured out that the cemetery was here, probably because of all the hauntings these houses were getting. I mean, that's just a little joke, but y you know, you know, probably not. And now visitors are let out here and basically told that this would have been the cemetery from the book Tom Sawyer. See, there's 1865, that's the Civil War one. 1855 there. Here's another example of a headstone that's just scratched in concrete. They also have found the graves of slaves out here and several graves from black Civil War soldiers, you know, who fought in the, uh, what's that Massachusetts regiment where it was all African Americans, we would say now, soldiers. So there's a lot of history out here, a lot of history. You can learn a lot about this cemetery if you take the Haunted Hannibal tour that I took last night. And if you want to get really freaky, they'll give you dowsing rods and you can try to ask the spirits questions and everything. I didn't do that, but I was looking over here because they told me that past this fence on this city property that's all overgrown the way this rest of the cemetery used to be, back here, was the Popper's graveyard, the real Popper's graveyard, where they just dumped people in unmarked graves back in there. So basically this is a dead cemetery, <laughs> no pun intended, and uh, they don't use it anymore. There's very, very few exceptions of people who were buried here a little later who wanted to be near, you know, ancient relatives. But for the most part, this place is, this place is pretty dead. It's cool coming to old cemeteries and looking at the headstones and especially the ones where you can't read the names, just thinking about how these were all people. They all had families, they all had lives. Like, look at Amelia's grave here. She was the wife of D. Foss. She died in 1854, aged 18 years old. 18 years old, the prime of life, married, probably so excited, probably in the beginning stages of marriage, so stoked on life, and she dies. I mean, this isn't just a cool, creepy goth stone, you know? This represents a person, a person who was buried right under me. Most of them are pretty hard to read, but I love the old inscriptions. Like this one says, Oh, how sweetly sleep the dead that slumber in the Lord. Before the Civil War, which was like just absolute chaos and essentially turned the United States into a giant death factory. Death was viewed just so differently. They used to bring the dying, you know, the family would gather around them. They would keep the dead body in the house for a long time. That was really weird because I thought I saw a person back there. They would keep the dead body in the house for a long, long time and they would sit with it and they would cry, they would mourn with it, they would take pictures of the recently deceased so they could remember what they looked like. People were comfortable with death. They lived with death. They looked at death. They experienced death on both sides of the curtain and cemeteries were much more a place where you would come and spend time. There was a lot more symbolism to headstones and to graveyards. That's why they were so elaborate and so beautiful. You see lots of hands with fingers, usually pointing towards heaven or towards the east where they say Christ will come back from. Lots of other guild symbols, like Masonic symbols on people's graves, usually because they would be part of an association that would bury them, like a fireman's association or something like that. I talked about that in that cemetery video when we went to Virginia City's cemetery, which is another place Mark Twain was at. See, look here at this one. You got the Star of David there, and then there's hands being shook in the center. Could that be Masonic? I don't know. I'm not a member, so I don't know if that's their secret handshake or anything. I'm also not a member of the Illuminati yet. See, there's some of the Civil War graves right there. And then over here is a sign talking about the Civil War graves and the 55th Massachusetts. That's what it was, where the uh, African-American Civil War soldiers fought for the Union side. It's very cool. A lot of history out here. Honestly, I would Google the 55th 
Massachusetts if you've never heard of it before. Oh, look, here's one. Here's one right here. 55th Massachusetts Corporal W.T. Norrison, I think, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, this is one of the guys. This is one of those guys who was a black American who fought, basically, they were fighting especially, to free slaves. That's pretty, that's right there, that's some interesting history. Anyway, look at this house right here. Would you live right up here next to the cemetery? Imagine when this was all overgrown, like those trees over there and stuff. Somebody was living in this house. There were kids growing up on the street, playing right up next to the jungle here that was covering these graves. Would you be comfortable with that? I, I think I could, I think I could probably do it. I could probably be comfortable with that. But if you think living close to this cemetery is creepy, I got something better for you. I got something a little bit better. Over here's a sign that describes that passage from Tom Sawyer. It was a graveyard of the old fashioned Western kind. It was on a hill about a mile and a half from the village. This is where Tom and Huck, hiding behind a great elm tree, watched as Injun Joe killed Doc Robinson, robbed the body, and then put, well, I don't want to tell you the rest of it. But this sign is basically saying that this is the graveyard from Tom Sawyer. The only problem with that is that it totally wasn't. See, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer covers the same era as Mark Twain's own boyhood. So like 1845 to 1850, somewhere in that time frame. Well, Mark Twain's own father was being buried in this cemetery at that time, which means this cemetery was covered with all kinds of brand new graves and was still well maintained and well cared for. The cemetery described in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer is all abandoned and creepy and had wooden headstones everywhere. So where the heck was that? This. This is the site of the cemetery from Tom Sawyer. According to the old records, this entire city block where there are now houses was once the original old school 1840s Hannibal and earlier city cemetery. Here's the thing, by the time they built that last cemetery that we were inside of, this place was completely abandoned, completely forgot about. When Mark Twain was growing up here, nobody even remembered who in the world was buried in this place. It was all wooden headboards like they have in the Old West, and they were all weather beaten and you couldn't read any of the names anymore. Any of the people there with family or loved ones had already been moved to newer cemeteries. So this was pretty much a crazy, huge city block way up on this hill, covered in trees and stuff, big old trees where uh, there were basically a whole bunch of weird, sunken in, shallow graves. This, this, this is where Mark Twain imagined the scene taking place in the book Tom Sawyer with the whole graveyard murder and the grave robbing and all that stuff. Like I said, you gotta read it. And here's the craziest part. You see all these houses here? That old cemetery, the old city cemetery, was so derelict and so forgotten about that they did not empty the graves before these neighborhoods were built here. That old city... <sighs> That old city cemetery, the old cemetery that was here, was so derelict, so abandoned, so forgotten about, that when they built all the new cemeteries, they never bothered digging up any of the old dead bodies from under this neighborhood. Oh yeah, so this house right here, this house for sale right here, could have some pretty creepy stuff underneath it. Sounds too weird to be true, right? Sounds like something that I'm making up, right? Something straight out of the poltergeist. But I assure you, this is 100% true. As a matter of fact, in the 1970s, one of these retaining walls here broke that holds up like all the houses all over Hannibal that are built on hills. One of these retaining walls broke and several dead bodies, bones, skeletons were washed out. Nobody, the Mark Twain boyhood home, the visitor center, even the haunted Hannibal tour Nobody really wants to talk about the fact that this whole neighborhood here is built on the remains of dead people. I don't think it's something that Hannibal's really super excited about, but it's true. Honestly, if you think about it, it makes sense. They probably don't want the kind of tourists who would come over here and be like, heck yeah, there's dead bodies under your house. Let me go in. But for all of those thousands and thousands of Tom Sawyer fanatics or Twainiacs who have come here looking at that other cemetery for Tom Sawyer's cemetery. No, no, no. This was it. Back in the day, learning anatomy and becoming a doctor and having to do dissections was super, super, super frowned upon. People did not donate their bodies to science. So what old doctors had to do, or they called them resurrectionists back then, they would have to go to old cemeteries like this and dig up dead bodies to dissect and use in their experiments. I know that sounds horrifying and terrible today, and people thought it was horrifying and terrible 
back then too, don't get me wrong. But that was the way that people living in a very, very superstitious society had to go about turning everything from superstition with medicine and guesses into actual science by robbing graves. So this neighborhood right here, this entire block, this was the spot in Tom Sawyer where Doc Robinson hired Injun Joe and Muff Potter to dig up that body. Nowadays, UPS would probably just deliver you a body if you were a doctor. Oh my gosh, what the heck? A vodka bottle. You don't think this could be Muff Potter's vodka bottle, do you? <laughs> wow! Anyway, that's something you won't find in any book that I know of, or on any travel websites, or on any of the Hannibal tours. That's just pure me being obsessed with Mark Twain and spending a lot of time on the internet looking up every possible detail about those books that I ever could. And I love history, and also all these houses are built on top of freaking graves, and there are still bodies under there. That's freaking crazy. So remember how I was asking you if you'd be comfortable living in those houses next to that last cemetery? Well, my next question for you is, how comfortable would you be buying and living in this house that's for sale right here, which is 10 to 1 sitting on top of some sort of human remains? Honey, we're... Oh, um. creepy. Also, they have satellite TV right here, which means that they have a TV for you to get sucked into. Yeah, judging by the angry stares of the neighbors who can overhear what I'm saying, uh, not a popular subject in the city of Hannibal. Probably not gonna be hearing about that one down at the visitor center. Although there is actually something I need to pick up from there. Just look at some of the houses in this town. They're freaking beautiful. You can literally pick up some of these houses, which obviously need quite a bit of repairs in some cases, for oftentimes like way less than 50 grand even, which would be impossible in Southern California. Granted, you're probably gonna have to put at least that much back in it, new roofs and whatnot. After Mark Twain's day, Hannibal became a massive lumber town. They would float all of the logs and stuff down the Mississippi River to Hannibal, cut them all up in the sawmills, and ship all the lumber over land via the brand new railroad here, both down to the south where everything was being reconstructed after the Civil War, and also out west where everything was being constructed for the first time out there. This resulted in a lot of wealth for Hannibal. There's almost 500 buildings here on the National Register of Historic Places in a town with a population of around 17,000. Basically, Hannibal's existed for a long time, and for every 10 years that Hannibal's existed, you'll have a whole different set, a whole bunch of different levels of mansions, some of which were built by the same people. They would just build another house and then a fancier house, and get a little richer and build a fancier house until you have stuff like Rockcliffe Mansion up on top of the hills here, which is just insane. Down lower, a little closer to the river, you got a whole bunch of fancy mansions, including my personal favorite and a house that was for sale for a little less than $200,000 pretty recently, the Robards Mansion. This place is a bed and breakfast that I did not get a chance to stay in this time, but it is most definitely one of my Hannibal goals. Because just look at the size of this place. It's massive, it's amazing. But in addition to being a beautiful historic house and apparently party central for Hannibal, as a lot of people listen to their radios down here, it's also one of the places that Mark Twain visited on his last trip to Hannibal. This house was built by Mark Twain's buddy, Colonel John Robards. John Robards grew up in Hannibal with Sam Clemens. He was one of the people who was running around with the original of Tom Sawyer, and he was such a trusted friend that he was the one that Sam Clemens, aka Mark Twain, trusted to be in charge of moving his dad's body from that old cemetery that we were in earlier to the newer, nicer, cleaner cemetery uh, south of town. On Mark Twain's last visit here in 1902, he visited his friend, Colonel John Robards, and John Robards' little daughter who happened to be dying at the time and the rumor. See, I don't know a lot of this stuff for a solid fact. I haven't done that much research, but I was told that she actually passed away in this house. The rumor is also that Mark Twain actually slept in the house, although I'm not 100% sure that's true. It is definitely true, however, that he did visit the house and that this house was owned by one of his little Tom Sawyerish buddies from way back in Hannibal's heyday. Pretty amazing, right? And not that long ago, it was for sale. Like I said, I'm pretty sure for less than $200,000 Although nobody would buy it for me, no matter how much I wanted to turn it into a Haunted Mansion themed b and I've been to a lot of tourist places all over the country and actually now starting to be all over the world. Been a lot of places where people look really disappointed because they can't find anything authentic, they can't really touch history, you know? Hannibal is not one of those places. Touch history? Heck, 
you can buy a lot of the history here. And honestly, it probably wouldn't even cost you that much. These are the kinds of places that really struggle for business. They really struggle to get tourists over here. And these are the kinds of places I really like to visit now because I feel like if more people knew that places like this existed and that they could sleep in them, uh, more people would be visiting Hannibal. Look at this, right across the street from the Robards Mansion. This place was built in 1850. So when Mark Twain was growing up here, this would have been a wealthy person's house. And then by the time he came back, this was a wealthy person's house. Not the, not the van. I think if you're living in the van, probably not that wealthy. Anyway, some epic history for you right there. It's another thing I don't, you really don't see that much about on the internet, but years of being really nerdy about Mark Twain has led me to know about all kinds of weird stuff. Oh yeah, speaking of uh, fancy houses. Right over here we have the site of a very fancy house that is no longer here. This was once the site of Amos Stillwell's house who was horribly murdered with an ax while his wife and kids were home. Apparently his wife went up, put the kids to bed, and then Amos was like, so-and-so, whatever his wife's name, is that you? And then was brutally murdered with an ax, like pretty much like right here somewhere. Then when the wife found her husband, she runs to some guy's house over here, the first light she found on or whatever, goes, oh my gosh, my husband's been murdered. And then while he's putting on his clothes, she goes back over to the house and starts cleaning up the blood and stuff while that guy goes and runs for the cops, which were right down there, which she could have run to in the first place for herself. But Instead, she ran and got this different doctor over here because she's like, oh, I'm feeling faint. And then that doctor came to the house and was like, oh, you, you better not question old wifey because she's really upset because her husband's all ax murdered right here on the floor and has no face. And then basically, if I'm remembering this right, they could never solve the crime. But exactly a year later, the lady, the wife lady from here and the doctor over there was like, oh, better not ask her any questions, get married in the front room of the house or something where the guy died or something, it's really suspicious. So basically, the horrible ex-wife and her new husband get run out of town because the circumstances are so fishy. But the Stillwell family owned the house forever and ever and ever and had it demolished so that people wouldn't come here and be like, this is where the Stillwell murder was. Now, that murder happened all the way back in 1888, I think, but it was super famous and basically reported about all over the country. That was way the heck before CNN, so something getting reported about all over the country, and that's, that's some pretty big news right there. There. Now you might be wondering why I'm even talking about this or showing you this since there's nothing here and that's because I learned about this story on that haunted Hannibal tour and over in their office downtown they have something from the house. Across the street from the main Mark Twain Museum building is the Hannibal History Museum. This museum is operated by Ken and Lisa Marks, a historian husband and wife couple who not only run the haunted Hannibal tours but literally wrote the book on this town. No, literally. Inside of this very very interesting place is a very interesting artifact. This thing right here was the upper part of the mantle in the Stillwell house. This thing witnessed the murderer. There were a lot of people in the Victorian era that believed that if you died in front of a mirror without covering it up that the spirit could get into it and get trapped in there. So after someone died they would like cover up all the mirrors and stuff. So this right here could be a haunted Mirror. They never proved whether the wife and her lover killed Amos Stillwell. But this mirror right here, this could tell us the truth if we did some kind of weird Ouija board candle seance thing. That I'm, not, I'm not doing it though. But if any of you want to come here and stare deeply into this mirror, you might be able to uncover the truth. This is, this is really, this is creepy. Honestly, the longer that you stand here and stare into this mirror and think, the more you think about it, the creepier that it gets. A guy was murdered in his own living room, basically. Maybe in front of this mirror? Ooh, creepy. But that's not all they got in here. Among all the other displays detailing the history of Hannibal, they also have the remains of an old tourist attraction, the old Tom Sawyer Diorama Museum. In here are 16 dioramas created by artist Art Seaving. That's a pretty convenient name for an artist. <laughs> that detail the story of Tom Sawyer and used to be part of a Tom Sawyer gift shop. The gift shop is now closed, but the museum has preserved the dioramas. Everybody remembers the part where the boys paint the fence, but nobody ever likes to remember the parts where they discuss witchcraft, they get beaten, they witness a grisly murder in a graveyard while someone's trying to steal a dead body, they run away from home and smoke tobacco, they hang out in a haunted house with a murderer. See, look at there they are, peeping on him. The peeping Tom! Or at least one of them is, because get it? Tom Sawyer, and he's peeping. Oh, never mind. They get lost in a cave, and a Native American. 
guys. Mostly because Tom didn't tell anybody he was in there. Not exactly the children's book that everybody remembers it being. You know, just saying. Uh, I love history. Also, side note, this was the town where Cliff Edwards used to live, who was the voice of Jiminy Cricket. See? Look at that. I never knew he was once known as Ukulele Ike. Not sure if that's actually his ukulele, but uh, look at these. That's Jiminy Cricket right there. Apparently he was very popular and handsome and could play the ukulele. Man lived in Hannibal. All things that I did know, but I'm, but for the sake of, I never knew that before. To be fair, the first time that I did learn them, I learned them here. In the Hannibal History Museum. Ken and Lisa weren't in there right now, but you should drop by sometime. Not only is the museum freaking free, but like I said, they do the Hannibal Ghost Tours here, and they wrote the book on the town. Literally. And, uh, they're also super into steampunk, so if you have any questions about steampunk, this is the place. I really love this town. I'm gonna be super, super sad to leave it. It's not just the history and the Mark Twain stuff. Everybody here is super friendly, super cool. The weather's actually been really good. There's a lot of antique stores here, which is super cool, including this one, which has a lot of really weird, really, really weird stuff in it. And also, this is the place where I bought that steamboat that I got yesterday. But I don't know, you got the trains and the riverboat and the Mississippi rivers going by. And you got super terrifying stuff like this thing. What the hell is that? What the hell? What the frippin'? What in the world is going on in there? And the Bride of Chucky? Mrs. Clemens shops. Ooh, whoa. I never knew how much Mrs. Clemens loved Disney stuff. Dang, you don't think she was a Disney bounder, do ya? She was also into really, really terrifying dolls. What the heck? Whoa, what the heck? What the heck? What the heck? Okay, officially, one of the coolest stores in the world. At first I thought all of these were displays, but all of these things are for sale. Well, hi there, Sheriff. Are you for sale? You look friendly. He looks friendly, doesn't he? She's for sale. Marilyn Monroe right here is for sale. The creepy cat people are for sale. This woman here is for sale. Oh, told you they were into creepy dolls. This is one of the best antique stores of all time. For real, this is simultaneously the coolest and partially the most terrifying place I've ever been. Whoa. 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 Ooh, it's not real. Like, I'm sure these are fancy and collector's items and everything, but I cannot even express to you how much I feel like I'm just walking around a pile of dead babies. Also, way more than in the cemetery, I have this constant feeling of being watched because there's so many mannequins in here. They even have a giant... Pillsbury Doughboy mannequin. They got a Terror Mickey in here, and a Terror Monkey, and the scariest Pinocchio I have ever seen. Look at this, this is scary. All right, just don't hurt anybody, Mr. Monkey, just. Uh. This is definitely a pretty bewitching place, let me tell you. I'm not sure if I'm more afraid of the Wicked Witch of the West or Dorothy. Um, I think I'm. I think I'm more afraid of Dorothy. Yep. This place is definitely weird. If I did a five weird things in Hannibal video, I know why I just need to come right back in here next time. I won't even really need to look around. Like, here's a pile of steampunk weapons. So, they got a bunch of Titanic stuff right there. Val Kilmer. I thought Mark Twain and I were friends. But this one looks like he wants to murder me. Not 100% sure that I'm not going to regret going into Mrs. Clemens' attic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this place is definitely haunted. Like, don't get me wrong, they got some radical stuff in here. But some of this stuff is straight up terrifying. Oh, what the heck? What the heck? This scared the heck out of me. You suck, Beetlejuice. Don't be scary. Okay? Or you, face man. This part is kind of awesome. I don't know why, but this, this part right here is the, actually like the least creepy part. Ugh. Well, not entirely the least creepy. How come I can walk around all like the horror mannequins and stuff and see the Annabelle doll and I'm good, but if I look at the doll that's supposed to be realistic, like a real person, I'm terrified. Okay, this right here, this is awesome. This just says Tiki Man on it. But as we all know, that's Pele, goddess of fire and volcanoes from Disneyland. This is the freaking Rolly Crump 
Disney Pele right here. It has a little bit of damage on it. Like, I don't know what that is right there, but this thing is huge and kind of heavy. So this might be the hugest mistake ever, but I'm totally getting this. I have never, ever seen one of these before, which is rare for me because I love tiki stuff. And obviously I love Disney. So even if I end up not having enough room for this, I'm definitely sure I can find a Disney fan who does. Also, there's a freaking life-size Ewok right there for like 200 bucks. Cannot afford, but that's still awesome. Okay. I need that in my life. Yeah, I'm possibly not take care of him. Immediately. I want to put this away. And then I got some other stuff to do in town real quick before it all closes. Awesome. God, I really, really, really love this place. There's Mountain Dew machines everywhere here. I didn't get to show you guys half of the stuff that I looked at, and I didn't get to look at half of the stuff that I wanted to see. But I'm out of time, and at least for Hannibal, out of money. And so as much as I love Mark Twain, and as much as I really love this town, tomorrow morning when I check out, I gotta be Heading on farther down the road. There's just one more person that I have to meet before I can leave old Hannibal. Oh, I hope we're not too late. We can get you on away. Mark Twain, it's nice, nice to, meet to, you. to meet you. Wow, I did it. I met Mark Twain. Now I can go home and sleep well. Wait a minute, I think that guy was an imposter back there because Mark Twain? I didn't realize you still lived in Hannibal. Well, I don't always come back every day. Well, I'm happy to meet you. Yeah, I just met an imposter, Mark Twain, over at the museum. Well, it's the highest form of flattery, so it doesn't bother me. To quote Biff Tannen from Back to the Future Part 2, what the heck is going on here? <laughs>